Drug addiction is a disease. It is resistant to treatment, it is subject to relapse, and it can be fatal. These people are the casualties of this war, and it's not a war on drugs, it's, it's a war on people. Teaching yeah. people how to be people and providing value in their lives, that's what we're supposed to do as a society, and we have utterly failed this you know, population. Lava for Goods, the War on Drugs podcast, exposes what they describe as the absurdity of the real-world consequences of 50 years of our failed war on drugs. There are co-hosts here, comedian Clayton English and Greg Glod, Senior Criminal Justice Fellow at Americans for Prosperity. These guys examine the cost of five decades of the policies that we have embraced, the policing that's been done, the persecution of people that, in their view, and one in which I share, are sick. These two really cover a diverse subject matter. They peel back the surface of this complicated period in our history and talk about how the war on drugs has really fueled over-incarceration has actually exacerbated addiction and come at a very high cost economically. So, Greg, Clayton, welcome to the podcast. You said it in one sentence pretty well. It's a war on people, not a war on drugs. What needs to change? If we're not going to do what we're doing, and clearly what we're doing is not working, Everybody wants to point to the pandemic now because it was a major event, but this was a problem way before the pandemic. We go back to prohibition and all this kind of thing. We're not going to arrest our way out of this. So what should be happening right now? What should we be doing? So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot from, you know, from a public policy standpoint to try to kind of right some of the wrongs from the laws that are on the books and the things that we're able to do, you know, um, you know, our, our team works a lot on, on Capitol Hill and in states to, um, you know, right now we're working on a bill called the Equal Act, which would, you know, stop the um, crazy chasm between how we treat crack cocaine compared to powder cocaine, um, which are essentially pharmacologically, you know, identical except for crack, the way that you bake it. Um, allows it to be a much more pungent punch, cheaper uh, and shorter lived. And so that was essentially established after, you know, in the in the 80s, um, kind of seeing the crack cocaine epidemic. And this is the way that we that we're going to get out of it. It was a failure. And so to make that a one to one and start right sizing some of those laws, reduce some of the mandatory minimums, allow for judges to see a case and say, the mandatory minimum says you're supposed to go to 10 years, but I think that you would be much better in recovering addiction. So you're going to go to jail for two. You know, there's all these things that we can kind of start picking at the edges around, uh, limit the ways that law enforcement's able to, you know, do uh, no knock warrants based upon, you know, a, a minor drug bust and things like that. There's a lot of those civil liberty aspects of things. But when you're talking about actually winning this drug war overall from a policy standpoint, it is start to take a healthcare approach rather than a criminal justice approach to allow for experts to lead on this uh, and get people into recovery, you know, through methods that we know work. And so, um, you know, I, I one thing I, I do somewhat agree with, but I don't like the way that it's been implemented in practice. Um, it, it is kind of some of the, you know, medically assisted treatments that we see, um, you know, that have been effective in places like Europe and Switzerland, where you allow people to yeah. to come in and, and utilize, you know, um, you know, drugs and wean them off in a certain way. But I think that we failed at that as a public policy standpoint, kind of going the other way and have allowed for open air drug markets to proliferate in places like San Francisco and Philadelphia and Baltimore. And I don't think that's the right way either. We need to find that balance between, you know, actual tough love um, and allowing for this and understanding that aspects. But we kind of go one way or the other. We either try to criminalize our way out of it or essentially ignore the problem. And it really is that tough love standpoint where we have carrots, we have sticks. Um, you know, you can't just you have to earn your way off of this, but also lead you through a place of empathy and understanding that failure is a part of recovery. Um, that's the one part you see a lot of things that we try to do from diversion. But the first time they have a dirty urine, urine test or the first time they miss a meeting, we throw them out on their ass or we throw them in prison. And these are the types of things uh, that fail and what bring people back to relapse. So um, it's complicated. It's messy. 
Um, but having that tough love aspect and trying to lead with policy and evidence rather than kind of feel, um, that's that's where we need to start at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. And let's talk about that for a minute because I'm well aware of some of the safe zone practices and stuff in some of the Nordic and European countries and some of those that advocate for that in the United States and they cite the success levels in Europe to justify doing that here, but they're not doing the same thing here. That's just bullshit. And maybe it's a thin line between enabling and actually keeping people safe. And it has to do with outcome criteria, I guess. If your outcome criteria is we haven't had a single overdose because we got lasers to shoot through here and see if there's fentanyl in here. We have people there to intervene if there is an overdose. And so we haven't had anybody die in our clinic here. Okay, that's true. But we're not trying to get people to use destructive drugs safely. We're trying to get them off of the destructive drugs And my problem with some of these programs is they don't have a strong enough exit strategy. Right. They got a strategy to get them into the safe zone, but they don't have a strong enough exit strategy to get them out into a program that can actually get them off of the drugs. Right. That's well, we have a social worker in the building. Well, yeah, I, I got it. But there's not really a strong enough exit ramp to get them out of the safe zone and into rehab. And they say, well, look at our criteria. We haven't had a single overdose. And there are people dying on the street, but they're not dying in here. Well, that's surrendering to the disease. Yeah. 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 They say, we're going to go along with you doing the drugs as long as you don't die on our turf. That's, to me, not a solution. And I I think in, what is it, Switzerland? Or was it? Yes. they actually have where they get the people a job, and the person has to go to work. And there's more... Step like you said, the criteria is more than just "Hey, you didn't die," and right. yeah, that's a very low bar to have. Like, and and I don't think that's very much different than how we look at the people that where we look at them like they're the outcasts of society. Yeah, the, yeah. the goals the goals there are recovery and to to move on, and I think the goals here those are not the same goals. And actually, you kind of look at where a lot of those European countries were prior to trying to bring these types of policies in they're doing they were doing what you know san francisco and other places are doing essentially just having safe zones and enabling but it actually didn't get to the underlying root causes until they started getting you know more intentional about treating people and weaning them off the ultimate goal is to have less addiction to have people recover to have them thriving jobs not just to not have someone die here. It kind of reminds me of almost like the parent that everyone knew in high school that allowed everyone to drink at their house. And then it was like, all right, you're safe here for the next four hours, but on your way after that, like it's not really helping. You're enabling a problem instead of actually trying to get to that root cause. So having those interactions between, you know, addiction specialists and doctors and social workers and putting in safe environments, great, but it's kind of like with prisons, like, all right, you have these people here, you have this captivated audience, What's the next step? And we're not doing that next step here. And it's looked at as empathy. Um, and I think it's coming from a lot of the times, a good place of empathy to try to help people. But we're really not providing that you need to stop doing the behavior you're doing or else this is only going to get worse. And yeah, I, it's, it's just it's, it's a tough road. But yeah, that, that's what we need to do. We're not doing that. It's based on the wrong predicate, though. Like the parent who says, well, if my child's going to drink... I'd rather them drink here. Well, that's a big if. Right. You know, if your aunt had nuts, she'd be your uncle. That's a big if, you know? (laughs) So you got to say, if my kid's going to drink, are you giving that up if your kid's going to drink at 14? Well, you're saying here in these safe zones, if you're going to do drugs, well, let's not just accept the predicate to that hypothesis there. If you're going to do drugs, well, let's not accept that you're just going to do drugs. What if you don't? What are we offering you as an alternative to that? And the answer is nothing. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're almost, you're saying that this is, this behavior is okay. And you're, and not providing an actual path away from it. And so why wouldn't they drink and drive later on? Essentially you're getting kind of tacit agreement that this is fine. If I could do it here, <laughs> I can do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Why not? And then you, and then you have a lack of a law enforcement approach when they're 
not doing things. So you are in these open air drug markets and you're doing that, but it's not like there's enforcement beyond these areas to actually help keep places clean. And, um, you know, the thing that they're not doing as well, and, you know, a lot of the places like in, in Switzerland, they're actually providing medical care through providing the methadone or potentially and sometimes, you know, heroin or the actual drug. A lot of the root causes of crime are people trying to keep up with a two, three hundred dollar habit. And that's not getting to that. They're bringing their own drugs there to essentially use in a certain way, but they're still having to rob, deal, prostitute, whatever else to get the financial means to get that. And so you're you're not actually tackling a lot of these underlying problems. You're just kind of giving a safe space for a couple hours, then all the other problems still exist. And uh, it, it just I, I don't see how that's going to be effective uh, long term. I deal with a lot of these families that have a heroin addict in the family, and they'll tell you, look, we don't want them dying under a bridge, but if we let them come home and we go to sleep, they will come in our room. They'll steal everything we own. They'll take our credit cards out of our wallets. They'll take money, jewelry. Yeah and go out and turn it into drugs because we all know if you're seriously addicted, you're going to do whatever it takes to get that next fix because you're trying to avoid being deathly, deathly ill. Yeah. So what do we tell those families? And they say, well, I'd rather them be in jail than under a bridge. They can't come home. I don't want them under a bridge where they're going to get beaten, raped, robbed, killed, or whatever. If they're in jail, at least I know where they are. Well, I suppose there's something to that, but giving somebody three hots and a cot so mom doesn't have to worry is not the objective of incarcerating people. Right. A, right. they're going to do drugs while they're in jail, and B, the minute they get out, they're going right back into the system they were doing drugs with yeah. before. So let's be specific. If we're going to spend the next 50 years focused on something what are the three or four priorities that the policy needs to focus on for the next 50 years? I think the biggest thing is to remove the incentives that kind of proliferate the drug war first off when you're talking about kind of just big government and continue to turn the wheels. And so one of the problems that we have right now, and you see this all throughout the drug war, is that there is an incentivization to continue to make these low level arrests through either grant programs or or whatever, or it makes you look good. The more arrests you have, the more prosecutions you get on these. And we go after the lowest common denominator because these are the easiest cases. And so kind of removing some of those incentives away, saying that good policing doesn't look like the amount of arrests you have. Good, good prosecuting doesn't mean how many convictions you're getting. Um, and so we have to really divorce those things away from each other. So that's one policy standpoint I think we really need a hit on. And then I think a lot of this is taking a lot of the resources and dollars that we're putting in, just locking people up and trying to find those alternatives and setting up actual statewide healthcare centers that can come together with law enforcement and, and actually try to bring people out with checks and balances and incentives and carrots and sticks. And we've seen that being effective in, in minor little you know studies and things like that, but doing that on an expanded level um, I think it's going to be helpful. And then also kind of implementing some of these things in practice in a correctional facility. You know, one of the things that we've been pushing for is, you know, having some sort of medically you know, assisted treatment within jails and prisons. And because of the lack of correctional officers or because of the lack of resources or really the, the desire to even do any of this stuff, people try to, you know, try to get off or wean drugs in jail in this horrific setting um, when we should be trying to kind of help them bridge that if we're going to have in this carceral area. So I think that's something um, that we really, really need to start looking on. You've seen a lot of effectiveness in uh, reducing overdose deaths, reducing uh, addiction post-release, uh, if you're able to kind of tackle that problem while they're incarcerated, if we're going to continue to incarcerate people for these types of things. And so those are, the, I think, the the, the main ones um, that I'm looking at. And then a lot of it's with social stigma with addiction still. I think there's still propaganda and a villainization of people that that utilize drugs. And this is a behavior that we don't want, but that doesn't mean people are evil if they if they go through that. And so I think we're slowly seeing, you know, Dr. Phil, one of the things I that's been actually, you know, a positive of kind of the opioid epidemic and fentanyl epidemic um, is that it has been hitting different social areas. It's been hitting rural places. So people that were kind of at a distance from the drug war for a long, long time are now seeing it face to face and understand, well, that's Tommy, our neighbor's kid. He's not a bad kid. He just 
he's a screw up here and there and he messed up here and he's gotten into some stuff or I know Bob lost his job or I lost my job or I got strung out on opiates, you know, with a busted knee. And now, you know, my doctor's unprescribed, like you kind of see it firsthand. And I think that changes people a little bit. And so reducing that stigma, um, I, I think will be a, a major aspect. And we're slowly starting to see that, but those are kind of the the biggies from a policy perspective that I could see is much more investment as a healthcare issue than, than a criminal justice one and removing yeah. those incentives for the criminal justice system to continue to proliferate off this. Clayton, what do you think people need to hear that are on drugs that's going to get them to be drawn towards some kind of help instead of hide from people that are out there trying to help? What do you think people need to hear that are on the drugs? Man, that's a tough one. But um, I think they, they need to know that it's, it's people that actually care about them. And there there's people out there that want to see them a functioning member of society. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't really, I don't really know where to begin. I think like I even, even I have people in my family, like you don't know, you, you want them to get the help. It's like you said, you, you bring them into your house and they could be good for max, maybe two weeks before stuff starts turning up missing and everybody's going to turn on them. And that's why they're out on the street. That's why they're cast out. But I think that there's people out there that, you know, want to see them do well, but, uh, it's, from what I hear, they gotta hit that bottom. You know, they gotta they gotta hit rock bottom before they even start seeking help, or they gotta get to such a low point that, you know, it, it's it's sad that that's the way it is. But that's what I hear. So, I think the best thing people can do that aren't on drugs is be there and help guide these people when they're trying to come back into society and not just look at them like they're the lowest piece of trash. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, it's it's trying to show that they have value and that they can provide something and actually showing that in action. Um, you know, I, I this always sticks out to me when when I visited a prison, there was a guy that was in and out of it. It was either, you know, a string of robberies or largely, but a lot of it was underlying was drugs to kind of keep that habit going. And he finally got enrolled in a class while he was in prison. And he said something. And the instructor, he said, you know, said like, oh, you're 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 really smart. You and he's like, that's the first time I've ever heard anyone say that. Um, and he had been like a model inmate since then. And I, I think he's released at this point unless something else had happened. But I, I do think it is that value aspect that people don't see their value um, once they get into this process and they're living day in and day out just trying to keep this fixed. And so can we provide you with some value either through family reunification, through maintaining and earning, uh, you know, uh, living accommodations, either through work or treatment and things like that. I think earning those types of things not only does it you kind of bring you out and give you that incentive to stay uh, within this better environment, but it brings pride to you. It brings something like there, there's nothing more prideful than doing well at your job, being able to buy a house or buy that new car and like striving for those goals and earning them. You know, you see it all the time with like people that win the lottery, you know, they get a millions and millions of dollars and then they're bankrupt and on their ass like you know later because they didn't earn it. They didn't actually yeah. do that blood, sweat and tears like Clayton. How amazing was it to probably open for Chappelle or win last time I said when you had done all those hours before going into shitty comedy clubs across the country, yeah. doing opening acts, all that open mic stuff, like to finally like hit that point peak. That's what matters like that. And then you're like, OK, I like I, I've made it like and that means so much more than like, here's your award or you're playing the forum tonight. You didn't earn right. shit. like it's, right. it's a bigger diff. Yeah, it's. And when you say that, I think the thing that I would tell people that are addicted is kind of learning from Dr. Phil just now while we've been sitting here is figure out what you want to do. Figure out what you want to do, where you want to be. And it's, it's so many people who have came from addiction that have gone on to be some of the most prolific writers, actors, musicians, all types of beautiful art has been created from people who, if we just looked at them at one point in their life, would be viewed as an addict. So yeah, find something. Because comedy was definitely that for me. I think you guys are hitting on it spot on because I've talked to so many hardcore addicts and the first thing that jumps out at me is they think they're living the life that they're worthy of. If they're prostituting themselves or they're living on the street and they haven't bathed for a month, they've got head lice or whatever it is. 
you talk to them and you listen to their internal dialogue, if you can get them to tell you what they're telling themselves, you don't ask yourself why they're doing it. You ask yourself why not, because right. they're telling themselves that they're worthless human beings and that if they overdose, so what? It's no big loss to their family, to society, or whatever. Anytime you start telling somebody, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, defensiveness goes up really high. But if you approach them, like both of you just said it, if you approach them from the standpoint of saying, hey, I love you, I care about you, you deserve better. I want treatment for you. I want help for you because you deserve it. You deserve a better life. You deserve this help. And then the focus has to be on making them feel like they're worthy of receiving that help. I can't tell you how many times I've had addicts sitting on stage with me and I stop and say, let me ask you something. You're here right now with me on this stage, and you have the undivided attention of my team over the last week, and me now, and all these people here, how do you feel about that? And you would think they would say, fortunate. I feel like I'm really, and their response invariably is, I don't deserve it. Right. I'm not worthy. I'm sitting here with you, and there are 10,000 people that want to be in this chair I'm not worthy of being here. Somebody else should be here instead of me. And somebody else your team should have been working with. And you're offering me this amazing rehabilitation opportunity and all this professional help, and I don't deserve it. It's clear to me that the fundamental threshold you have to cross over is they have to decide, I am worthy of it, and I'm going to live up to that. If we had spent 50 years helping these disenfranchised, marginalized, no goal, no passion people to feel worthy that they can require more of themselves and they deserve more of this life, I think we'd be a lot further along than we have been arresting them and locking them up for a half an ounce of this or a half a gram yep. of that. If we had taken all that time and effort and helped them feel better about who they were, then you treat yourself better. No. Yeah. yeah. And we're not doing that. No, it's exactly yeah. right. And, you know, just like any war, to be effective, you have to essentially turn your population through propaganda against this enemy. And that's what we've done, just vilify this population and made them seem like they're lesser than. Um, and that's been by practice. That's not, you know, that's that's not a flaw in the system. That's been by design. So that they, yeah. they're able to increased sentences. So you can do all these things with civil asset forfeiture, where you take people's stuff without convicting them of a crime, uh, where you're able to utilize a no-knock war and essentially deprive people of these liberties because of this war, because drug addicts are bad and they're villains. They are the enemy of this war. And we have done that over and over again, rather than saying, this is a problem. This is some behavior that we don't want in our society. But the way we get out of this is love, empathy, and value in these people around the other way, just like anything else. I mean, think about you know, beating your kids, spanking your kids, you know, doing all these things to children, you know, we would we not accept, like, it's not that hard. It's not rocket science, understand. It's not anything different um, than, than what you're saying, just how you do parenting or being a teacher, or anything else, just teaching yeah. people how to be people and providing value in their lives. That's what we're supposed to do as a society. And we have utterly failed this, you know, population. Laura Nyrider is a clinical professor of law and co-director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law in Chicago. Now, Laura represents individuals who were wrongfully convicted of crimes when they were children or teenagers. Her clients have included Brendan Dassey, whose case was profiled in the Netflix global series Making a Murderer, and Damian Eccles, of the West Memphis Three, whose case was profiled in the documentary West of Memphis. Dave Thompson is the president of Wicklander Zulowski and Associates, Inc. He is also a leader in non-confrontational interview and interrogation training. Uh, he doesn't want to demonize police in any way, and like me, is a supporter of law enforcement. But there are some that abuse the system. 
Dave incorporated evidence-based investigative interrogation, which focuses on building genuine rapport, asking open-ended questions, and using academic research to train for investigative interviews. Together, they have a collaboration that, let's face it, is a bit unexpected. A defense lawyer and a law enforcement trainer, which they will also tell us about. Well, let's talk about how this came about, because... Frankly, a defense lawyer and someone that works on the police side of interrogation and training police officers on interrogation, these are not birds of a feather usually. So the two of you together, which I love, by the way, and we've worked together before, we've been on the show, the three of us, and I found both of you provocative and informative, but how did this come about, the two of you together? Well, I'll let Dave uh, Dave tell the story, but you know it's it's just been one of the most incredible partnerships. And you're right; it's not every day that a defense attorney comes along and you know becomes a close colleague of of a, somebody who's dedicated to training law enforcement. So I like to think uh, of our evolution here as, as as a way to build bridges and come together around some really important issues: wrongful convictions. You know, no one wants the the wrong person convicted. Everybody wants the right person, right, to be taken off the streets while the innocents get to go home at night. So. I think that's the foundation for this. And, and Dave, you can tell the, the story of what uh, introduced us to each other's work. Yeah. And I think there's probably no better time to talk about, about this. I mean, we're in such a divisive society right now, whether it's politics, criminal justice, or, or any kind of reform. And, um, you know, the simple way to put this, and you mentioned Brendan Dassey's name earlier, like most people, I sat and watched Making a Murderer and binge watched it over a weekend several, several years ago. And um, I saw the interrogations of Brendan Dassey. And I have the wonderful opportunity to work for an organization that has a platform of teaching law enforcement. And so when I saw what happened there, I kind of recognized that if if we don't say anything, that's just as good as us blessing and recognizing that that technique was permissible and it's a reliable confession. I didn't believe that. So I had the chance to reach out to Laura and some others involved in the case. And uh, from there, I realized that we're really not on two different sides of the same argument. We're really on, on the same one. We're, we're looking to make sure law enforcement has effective tools to solve cases and protect public safety. And I think we've actually seen more uh, that we have in common than we actually have apart throughout this partnership. Well, I think you do, too. And I said some of this when we've talked before, but I really worry sometimes about the government and in this situation prosecutors who do become abusive. I mean that at several different levels, but as I've said before, I think they forget what their job is, and their job is to seek justice, not a conviction. I think sometimes they get into a case and they get involved ego-wise and time-wise and career-wise. They get bought in And they go after a conviction as opposed to a just conviction. So they'll do virtually anything to get that conviction once they start down that path, whether it's just or not. And I can't believe that some of these prosecutors don't know when they've gone past the line and say, I've taken liberties here in getting a confession. I've taken liberties here in getting someone to say something that a reasonable, rational interrogation in the bright light of day with proper support in place would never have been given. Is that a fair statement or am I being too critical? I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that, you know, tunnel vision is a real thing that sets in, Dr. Phil, when you are in you know, the position of of prosecuting somebody, of telling a story about what it is they did, you know, I think it can be real easy for that tunnel vision to set in and, and make no mistake, right? I mean, all of us are vulnerable to that. All of us get wedded to our own narratives. There's no question about that. And that's why I think this partnership that Dave and I have forged has been so incredibly valuable because we can serve as as checks on each other. We can bounce ideas off each other. Am I getting too much, you know, in my own place of tunnel vision here? Right. Um, so those are the conversations we have all the time that are so useful as we as we think about moving forward. Right. And you mentioned, Dr. Phil, the prosecutor perspective here. And I think it's important to see how that trickles down to the detective. Right. I like what you said. You know, their goal is to seek justice, not a conviction. And when we look at the interview or the interrogation, 
the goal should be how do I obtain actionable intelligence versus a confession? And it's that mindset shift of let's get rid of this presumption of guilt. And instead, let's enter a conversation with the goal of let me obtain as much information as possible so that we can further investigate. But, you know, we've got this kind of CSI law and order effect where everybody thinks the goal of every conversation is to get the I did it. And in fact, that's that promotes the tunnel vision that Laura just spoke about. Yeah, I'm always concerned when you look at the evidence and you see there are interrogation methods that are long embraced and used by probably the vast majority of interrogators. They include certain things such as lying to a suspect, misrepresenting evidence, things that have been constitutionally protected in many ways. Those same things are used with sophisticated, intelligent suspects all the way down to those that are intellectually challenged. And when we look at the number of false confessions that lead to wrongful convictions, it goes up dramatically when you use those techniques with those that are less equipped to recognize and fend them off versus those that are equipped to recognize and fend them off, which tells you that it's not a level playing field. If you have someone that's got an ADIQ and no support system and you use those techniques, you're going to get two, three, four times as many false confessions as you do with a sophisticated suspect. So they have to know that they have tipped the playing field. Well, I agree uh, completely. And I think when you meant the first thing you mentioned, Doctor Phil, is the if there's if there's one kind of technique or traditional training, when when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you think about investigators that are they're going to talk to a witness, a victim, a potential suspect, regardless of age, um, or all the other vulnerabilities that could make risk factors, if if they're only trained in one technique, that's the only thing they're going to use. And we like to look back. And instead of always faulting the officer is what, what tools were they given in the first place to be successful? And what we're seeing now are things like trauma informed interviewing to recognize people that have been exposed to trauma, how that impacts their memory and their recall. Uh, we're looking at the social science of, you know, when we say juvenile or youth, you know, now we're looking at up, upwards towards the age of 25, not traditionally 18. And I think the more we know that we can educate investigators on, they want to do the right thing, but we need to provide them the tools to do so. I mean, I think that's one of the most important things that, that you're doing, Dave, and that we're doing in partnership. The, the amazing thing is, I think most people don't know that police are allowed to lie to kids during interrogations, much less that police have been trained to do just that. You know, this is being taught in all 50 states to our police officers, right, to our law enforcement that's out there on the streets. Uh, they're being taught to use these techniques and uh, you know the history here is is fascinating to me. These techniques in which we deceive and and manipulate people during interrogation. You know these techniques were invented way back in the 1940s and 1950s, and they have gone untouched. They are still in use today, even though now that DNA hasn't been invented, we're realizing that people are falsely confessing due to this manipulation so much more often than anyone would ever have thought. So we're at this moment now of realization, thanks to DNA technology, that these old, outdated techniques, it's it's time to get rid of them and, and do something new. I work with law enforcement as well, doing training and all. And I've been asked over the years so many times, is Stephen Avery guilty and is Brendan Dassey guilty? I've given the same answer every time. And that is, all I can tell you for sure is that neither one has ever had a fair trial. Don't know if they did or didn't. I can tell you what I think, what I know, is they've never had a fair trial. Well, look, I can speak only as Brendan's lawyer, but I've represented Brendan Dassey for 15 years now. And my work on his case and getting to know this young man who was 17 when I met him, he is 33 years old now. I am so proud to represent Brendan Dassey, the only evidence connecting him to this murder is this confession we're talking about, where he's not even able to describe what happened. You know, I mean, every citizen who cares about truth, who cares about due process, who cares about reliability in our criminal justice system should be jumping off their couches and, you know, 
rushing out there to make sure that this doesn't happen again, not to Brendan, not to any other special education student, not to any other kid, not to any of us, right? The way the system let that boy, now man, down is just heartbreaking. Uh, Laura, Laura provided the opportunity for us a few weeks ago to, to chat with Brendan. And I just, I think it's important for me to be able to, to say how kind and uh, inspiring Brendan Dassey is. And I can't imagine anybody I've talked to, I know we had uh, Terrell Swift on your show, anybody I've talked to that's been kind of a victim of this process, it just amazes me the hope and the positivity and the focus that they have uh, because they know who they are and they know what they did or did not do. And just Brendan, just one of the most, the positive, most inspirational piece of this whole puzzle, I think. Yeah. You know, he's, he's 33, as I said, and you know, Brendan has, I've watched him grow up and he's grown up into this unbelievably kind, you know, gentle, funny person who still has, he still has this childlike faith that one day justice is going to come for him. You know, it's remarkable after making a murder, all these people around the globe, millions and millions of people saw his story. They started writing Brendan letters, right? From all over the globe. You'd get these letters. He still gets like five or 10 letters every day. Really? From ordinary people who just, you know, it's nothing profound or eloquent, who just put down on a piece of paper, hey, Brendan, you know, hang in there. I'm thinking of you. I believe in you. Hold your head up high. You know, the truth is going to come out. This kind of stuff. He, he still gets these letters every day. He keeps them. And he writes back to as many people as he can, you know, given his limitations. He writes back to as many people as he can because those, those letters, you know, finding their way to his prison cell in rural Wisconsin, some from Australia, some from, you know, the other side of the country, some from just down the street in Wisconsin, those letters give him an enormous amount of hope. Lord, what is next for him and what's it going to take for him to get released, get reconsideration, get a fair trial? What's it going to take? It's going to take courage, Dr. Phil. It's going to take courage. You know, if someone in Brendan's position legally right now, um, the best option is to go to the governor of Wisconsin and seek executive clemency. In this case, a commutation, which means a cutting short of a sentence, essentially an act that would free him. So that's all that's left? That's Brendan's, um, you know, best option right now by, by a mile. So right now we are in a process of education, of collaboration, you know, reaching out to folks around the state of Wisconsin. Hey, have you heard about Brendan Dassey? Come talk to someone like Dave, right? A, a law enforcement authority who knows what he saw when he saw those tapes, who's shown those tapes to 50,000 cops around the country to train them. Um, you know, come and, come and just sit down with us, talk with us, watch this video, meet Brendan. And, uh, you know, I guarantee once you approach this case with an open mind, there's only one right, decent thing to do, which is free Brendan Dassey. And what is his sentence right now? He was sentenced to life in prison with the first possibility of parole in 2048, when he will be 59 Ugh. years old. 2048. That's right. That's right. Good God. You know, and one of the amazing things, Dr. Phil, is because of all these problems with his case that we're talking about, during his trial, when he was on trial back in 2007, the prosecutors actually offered him what they call a mercy plea. No strings attached. Just say you did it. We'll give you 15 years in prison. Don't have to testify, nothing. Just, just say you did it 15 years. He said, no, I didn't do it. I want to go to trial. I want to get through this trial. I want to prove my innocence. Now, because he went to trial and was convicted because people don't understand why someone would falsely confess, right? Right. Now he's got life in prison. He's done way more than 15 years. He's coming up on 17 years now. Yeah, he would be out. That's right. That's right. But he stuck to his principles and it landed him a life sentence. Wow. That's sad. Nobody knows. But like I said, what I know for absolute certain is he has never had a fair trial, and he certainly hasn't had a fair shake. I'm having lunch this afternoon with Marty Tankliff. I worked on his case back when he was still in on trying to get him out, and 
as you know, he was exonerated, yeah. got out, became an attorney, uh, is now adjunct professor at Georgetown, and works on just these kind of cases and has a family. And you just hope when you give people the chance they deserve, you see what happens. It's just astounding to me. No, it's what you were saying before, you know, the resilience that these folks show and and the, the, the humanity that that we're locking up wrongfully in these cases. Marty's a great example. You know, Dave, you know Marty as well as I do. Yeah, Marty's, again, another example of an inspiration. He's helped testify in some of these uh, legislative hearings to get policy change. He's been he's been a great support. Um, and, and I think, you know, if we could go on just real quick back to Brendan's case. And, you know, I mentioned we use some of these examples in our in our training, among other other cases and examples. I tell Marty's story all the time. Most, if not all, investigators identify the same thing when they watch these tapes. And I don't know the investigators that were involved in, in Brendan's case. I don't know their mindset at the time. Uh, but any when I talk to investigators today, when they reflect back, I'm sure they wish they would have done things differently, even just because of the reliability or unreliability that comes from those statements and the approach that was used. And um, I think that's powerful. You know, we've got investigators across the globe that recognize there's an issue with the reliability of that information. And as Laura said, that's the information that was used to convict. And so we, we've got a simple math problem here. Yeah, that's shocking. So what is the solution? A lot of what is being done, I think it's generous to say that it's confirmation bias. I think it's generous to say that it's tunnel vision. I think that there's just a lot of, I don't care. I've got somebody in the box here and my job's to get a conviction. I'm going to get a conviction. I've worked with so many of these prosecutors who have just told me straight up, I came over here, A, to get experience in front of a jury, and B, to build up a one-loss record, hopefully perfect, and then I'm going to jump to the defense side of the docket so I can then start recruiting these cases and say, hey, I was a prosecutor. I was your worst nightmare. I never lost a case. I know how to beat these cases because I've been on the other side. I think they've got an agenda. Some of these guys have an agenda. And then they're going to jump to the other side of the docket and try to get rich off of it. I think there's more larceny in their hearts than just simple confirmation bias. But what do we do? How do we fix this? What does the legislation need to call for? Well, I can speak to the to the law enforcement piece of this. Um, you know, there's a, a slide I have in our PowerPoint that says, if it, if it ain't broke, break it. And part of the first thing that we have to do when we're training investigators is identify they've used techniques for the last several decades that in their mind have been successful because they have successfully solved some, some cases. And so the first thing we have to do is educate what all of these potential tactics are that can be a, a problem. The second thing we have to do in conjunction with that is provide education on what training does work. You know, about almost a, a year ago now, my hometown of Buffalo, New York, we had a, a shooting, a racist attack at a grocery store. Sentencing was just about a week ago. You know, 10 people in our community were killed. And if you have to go interview the witnesses to a shooting, you, you can't be relying on these deceptive tactics or assuming how they're going to respond. You need to understand how trauma impacts those witnesses. And the same thing applies in all of these cases is uh, providing a tool for investigators to go get information from a legislative piece. The last the last third piece of this remedy is making sure not only policy and a department reflects new training, making sure that's bought in from the command staff top down, making sure the prosecutor's office knows what a reliable confession looks like. And if all that doesn't work and it hasn't, we have to know that about 30% of wrongful convictions contained a false confession, which means about 30% of these had confessions that were admitted by the courts as voluntary. And so the important piece of legislation is to provide the courts a screening tool to identify if all else fails, this shouldn't be used as evidence uh, in, a, in a conviction against a potentially innocent person. So I think those are the, at least the, the three prongs that we're working on on this side. You know, I just throw one other thing into the mix here that I think another thing that surprises people, ordinary people, is the idea of prosecutorial immunity and police immunity. You know, I mean, for those of us who are just, you know, doing our jobs, living our lives, you, you, you make a big mistake at your job or if you do something intentionally wrong at your job, you know, all of us can be held liable. People can sue us 
right? I can get sued as a lawyer for malpractice. We can all get sued in different ways, held accountable uh, for, for the things that we do wrong. But what's wild is that for police and prosecutors, it's not the same, right? They have been carved out of that system and given special immunity so that if you are a prosecutor and let's say you are a bad guy and you decide to intentionally frame someone, for murder, knowing that they're innocent, right? The worst of the worst of the worst things you can do. Send them away to prison for life or maybe to death row. And you do this on purpose. You cannot be held liable under the law because of immunity, right? And, and police officers have qualified immunity that act to protect them, even if they do things intentionally wrong. And I think that's a huge part of the system that's got to be fixed too. We can all be held accountable to each other. And there's no reason to take a couple of groups of professions, police prosecutors, and treat them different than doctors or teachers or, you know, other important people with important responsibilities in our society. Yeah, I think we're all three saying the same thing. Think about how many interrogations go on, how many interviews or interrogations, however somebody approaches it, go on every day. I think the vast majority of them don't have ill intent. I think they're trying to get to the truth, get to the bottom, find out what happened, and hold the right people accountable. I'm a huge supporter of law enforcement from the bottom to the top. But, man, when you get something that goes awry, I think depriving someone of their liberty in the United States is a very high standard, and it should be. Mm. Depriving someone of their life is the highest of high standards, and, well, it should be. There's got to be some kind of standard, some kind of review, check and balance system here. And having spent so much time in the litigation arena, I've told my staff here, if you get stopped, you get in juxtaposition to some crime, you don't want to say anything about anything to law enforcement. You need to get a lawyer and don't say anything. What advice do you guys give to your friends off the record if there's been a shooting, an incident, a bad car wreck, something that they're even tangentially involved with? What do you tell people when the police show up? How do you tell them to conduct themselves? I'll answer that because I think it's unique from my perspective. Call an attorney. And I think the same thing happens. I think police officers that we train tell their family the same thing it, because even by saying, obviously be respectful and cooperate, which makes sense, but cooperate is part of the problem, right? Because we all, we all perceive what cooperate means differently. If that's starting to give up information that you don't realize is going to incriminate yourself, even if incidentally is, is an obstacle and even with kids. So parents that are listening, parents are often the worst person to be in the room with their child during an interview. Uh, they don't, they're not giving good legal advice. They could be victim of the same technique. So um, you have the right to representation, use it. No question about it. You know, I'm a mom. I've got two little boys in school. And one advice I give, you know, my mom friends out there is put a letter on file with your, with your kid's principal at their school saying, you know what, if, if a police officer shows up at school, wants to question my, my child, right? This child, I am asserting for them their right to a lawyer in this letter. They have representation. I will get them representation. I do not want them questioned without me and and without a lawyer. Wow, what good advice right there from both of you. And I hadn't thought about the letter. Dave, I agree with you 100%. I've had cases where someone has died in the home and the spouse's parent has shown up to support and they just took them to the police station as witnesses, not as suspects, and listen to them talk, the spouse says, just feeling guilty, says, oh my God, I just feel horrible. I just blame myself. That was the beginning of them winding up in prison and ultimately committing suicide. And it began with them saying to their parent, I blame myself. That's terrible. And they didn't mean I caused the death. It's just I should have been there. I should have, you know, been more sensitive. I should have seen this coming. I should have, you know, how you self-recriminate when you didn't foresee something. And they wound up in prison 
and couldn't take it. And both of the children wound up without a parent because one was dead and the other killed himself in prison. And it all started with, I blame myself. I think we see the same. It's a, it's a terrible, but a, a good example of that. I think we see the same often with uh, wrongful death of a child or child abuse of, or teachers, parents, caretakers that, that feel this guilt and remorse and they're in this kind of state of trauma after something happened. And those types of spontaneous utterances can be easily misconstrued or used in the wrong, in the wrong way. So I think that's, that's really, really important advice. Yeah. And as we know, admission against interest is a exception to the hearsay rule. So they can use that and you're screwed. I just tell them, don't say a word. It's too bad because I think that so many of these people that are the detectives, the investigators are out there really trying to figure out what really happened. And the bad thing is when you get a false confession and you convict the wrong person, that means the wrongdoer is still out on the street. Yeah. And I think part of part of that is you asked for advice for maybe parents or listeners, but the law enforcement folks that are listening or those that have a phone that want to want to call and see how their department's training. When you look at investigators right now, they most departments, maybe annually or biannually, they have to get qualified on how to shoot a weapon, how to fire a weapon. They have to get trained and certified on use of force, on a taser, on how to drive their vehicle. But for interview and interrogation, which is we're talking about this whole, this whole session here and how powerful that is, it's often go to a two or three day class or learn on the job and one class for 20 year career, you're good. And what we need is more required mandated education and accountability when people aren't compliant with it, just like every other task that they have on the job. And because we're now seeing how powerful these tools are when they're used improperly. You know, people don't know the psychological subtleties of this and what's going on. We know psychologically, if you can keep somebody from making a denial, if they start to make a denial and you can stop them short, even if you just jump in and say their name, if they start to say, I didn't date, let me ask you something else. If you can just stop them, they're a lot more likely to ultimately confess if you don't let them dig a hole and they have a face-saving way out there are so many subtleties that people don't understand. And if they're using all of those things to back somebody into a corner, if you're a civilian, you can't know what all is going on in there. You need to have a lawyer and you need to zip it. You never have to talk to them ever, ever, correct? If you are charged with a crime, you never have to give an interview or a statement. Correct. That's exactly right. You never need to you, and you should not do it. Instead, you ask for that lawyer. Yeah. 